Hello, my name's Richard Moore. I'm with Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. And Daniel Freib. Hello, Richard. And it's not so much a case today of where are we, Lionel, but where were we? We were at the National Cycling Centre in Manchester, the Velodrome. Uh, last week we took a trip up there after our epic ride from Nottingham to Manchester for a couple of speaking events that we were doing. Um, you can listen to that in last week's podcast uh, with Ned Bolting. But we, yeah, we were at the Velodrome and uh, this week's episode is basically a special interview with Shane Sutton, who is the new Dave Browsford. Yes, for those of you who don't know Shane Sutton, he is a fairly erratic... I better watch what I say because he, he has a tendency to get a bit upset about um, the negative descriptions. He's certainly not abrasive in any way, Richard. Not abrasive at all. Um, irascible <laughs> Aussie, uh, Shane Sutton. Shane has been a fixture in the British cycling scene for, for many years, now several decades. In fact, he came over to Great Britain in the 80s to ride as a professional on the kind of city centre criterium circuit there was a very healthy very buoyant scene in the 1980s in Great Britain of televised city centre races and sh- there was a, a sort of a group a, a mafia might someone might have said of 50 odd British professionals and Shane Sutton was very much the boss the the, the patron the Bernardino of the British uh, professional criterium scene and he remained around the, the British cycling scene into retirement. He won the milk race as well, most famously, in 1990. Started the Tour de France for ANC Halfords in 1987 as well. Did, he did start it. I think he was the first man in the prologue time trial. He was the first man down the start ramp. So he was briefly yellow jersey on the road for about 10 seconds. Anyway, um, he then stayed in Great Britain. He uh, became Welsh national coach in the 1990s, which uh, brought him into contact with a young Nicole Cook, and we'll hear a little bit later on uh, some of uh, Shane's reaction to recent criticisms made by Nicole Cook um, of uh, Shane Sutton and the British Cycling Programme. And, uh, yeah, he's he's certainly uh, a character, isn't he, Lionel? He's somebody we've got to know pretty well over the years, um, always interesting and often entertaining to speak to, uh, a bit of a character. Yeah, he certainly is a character. I mean, he's, he is kind of larger than life um, he's not to everybody's taste I wouldn't have thought um, he might be quite difficult to work with if you were sort of shy and retiring and, and didn't like to be told how it was from his point of view I think that's fair to say and I think it's also fair to say that not everybody who's worked with him has um, got on as well as um, others I mean he does have kind of his favourites within the, um, the, the system you know he famously was got on very well with Chris Hoy Bradley Wiggins, Victoria Pendleton, they they were the kind of athletes that he really did work one on one with. And there are um, there are others who perhaps wouldn't have had such a uh, a good and strong relationship with him. Yeah, I think uh, he's very I mean he's made his name at post his own cycling career as a coach and he's a very um in your face sort of coach. I've seen him coaching. I've seen the way that he confronts riders and uh, presents them with very honest appraisals of, of how they're doing. His tactical knowledge is, is second to none. His um, his instincts for how bike races are won, whether they be on the track or the road, um, are, are second to none. I remember being in the hotel in Adelaide at the Tour Down Under in 2010 when Team Sky had just started, and I was talking to Bob Stapleton, who at the time was running the HTC High Road team, and he had clocked Shane Sutton that week, and he hadn't encountered him before, but he'd realised that this was somebody who was going to be quite important in the Team Sky setup. He could just see that he was somebody who buzzed around the riders, and 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 that he um, that there was a response from the riders when he was around. And uh, you know, he has been involved at times more in Team Sky than at other times. He was heavily involved in coaching Bradley Wiggins to the 2012. Tour de France but Daniel have you had many dealings with Shane over the years Um, probably less than you guys Um, he is always someone who certainly brought um, a bit of craft a bit of savoir faire a bit of kind of racing nous um, to that whole operation Um, obviously they're well endowed with scientists sports scientists um, you know a lot of sort of technical know-how but I think together with Rod Ellingworth he Shane has really um kind of tempered that slightly or or provided a perfect foil for all of that 
knowledge with um, you know kind of on the ground sort of nuts and bolts um, you know racing know-how really and I think Dave Brailsford has always said that that he's been vital for for those reasons and and you know there are certain riders in that program who've gone through that program um, who have probably taken more from people like Shane and Rod than they have from the sports scientists Mike Cavendish is certainly one um, I think he's had a fairly rocky well I think we'll hear about that um, in the interview but um, he's had a fairly rocky relationship with Shane but he was certainly someone who appreciated Shane's bluntness and um, lack of BS I suppose Yeah I mean Dave Browsford and Shane looked like such different characters but they worked very closely very well together I remember interviewing Browsford and um, asking him what it was about their relationship and he said that on the professional side the Shane has an ability to be watching a bike race whether it's on the track or on the road and Dave Browsford said it's like Shane's watching in colour and we're we're all watching in black and white and that you know Shane is watching on a different level and spotting little things and as we'll hear in the interview he's got a fantastic recall for numbers and and performances and he knows what people did when they did it how they did it and and I think that sort of depth of knowledge is uh, tremendously valuable but it's his character as much as anything because you know he doesn't take any nonsense um, he's very upfront. He'll, uh, you know, if you see him at a race, he'll tell you whether you've put on weight or lost weight. Well, he certainly does with me. Uh, I remember going for a ride with him at the at the Dauphiné in 2011 or 12, whichever year it was. We rode around the lake at Aix les Bains, and um, he 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 mocked me terribly for my awful form on a bike. And you can kind of see, it, but it, it was in a it was in a kind of encouraging sort of way, and he was giving me some tips about. Um, you know how to basically stop myself from eating and I'd become a better bike rider <laughs> brilliant <laughs> what, ge- what a genius anyway let's hear from uh, let's hear from Shane we we started off asking him about the big transition uh, this year at British Cycling with Dave Brailsford after 10 years stepping away as performance director and Shane Sutton who previously has performed in various roles um, most obviously and most often head coach uh, although you mentioned there that personality is a big thing with Shane and I've often wondered if his job title wouldn't be just be better off being Shane Sutton. Um, anyway, he's been head coach for a number of years and he's stepped into more of a management role taking over as performance director from Dave Brailsford. So we asked him how he was coping with that transition. Difficult. <laughs> no, I've been fortunate really. Um, as much as I still love coaching... And I still have a little bit of an input into the programs, and you know I see things that I think you know we're not doing bad, but we probably do better. So I do give a little input. Um, the transition for me has been tough, and obviously you know the rest of the world and all of you guys can see the changes that we've already made. Um, but they were probably needed. We need to freshen up. We need to make changes, and we've done that. But you know probably the most helpful thing on on route for me and in, in the transition has been Dave himself you know he's been there for me 24 7 you know Sky has been very supportive of me you know and I've still got my performance role there and you know we're one big family still and and you know when when Sky are out there racing you know I'm 100% behind them and the same GB out there racing Dave's 100% behind them so we're still one big family and um, I think without the support of you know Dave, I probably would have struggled a bit, but you know, with with Ian as well. Ian's been fantastic. Ian Dyer, I, no, Ian, Ian Drake, oh, Ian Drake. You know, sorry. and they've all helped me. And even Scott, you know, you, the the way we've we've conducted the press here and that through Abby and everything, you know, I've needed to understand all that because I've always stepped back from it and never wanted to be part of it. But obviously, sitting in this chair, you have to be. So, yeah, it's been a tough transition, but I've had had plenty of help. I mean, there's there's a lot of pressure that comes with with the job, I guess, after. Beijing and Lon- the London Olympics, which you you were a key part in in the success in those two Olympic Games, but there will be a lot of expectation that that's repeated in in Rio. Uh, how much do you feel that pressure? And how confident are you that that success can be maintained? Yeah, well, it's about continuous improvement, really. So obviously, we'd we'd like to think the, su- the success would follow if you continue in that vein. However. Um, life goes in cycles, you know, and you have a talent pool, and sometimes that talent pool tends to get, sat- you know, saturated. And I wouldn't say we've got a massive amount of talent, but I'd say we've got the tools in the box to do the job in Rio. And and now we're, you know, uh, got a new manager in in place at the you know academy level down. So we're really trying to, you know, enhance that talent pool again. 
and something that you know Dave did very well when he was here. You know, he used to put two year focus on you know post Olympics in in trying to bring talent through, and um, that's basically what we're trying to do now with this new manager and everything. And, and there's a big mission already. Uh, on what we call Tokyo now, so we're really looking at Tokyo because I think you know we're pretty set now for Rio. Uh, we're two years out, and we've I've always stated that we the whole team would be Rio ready by the first of January. And I think you know the arrival of Heiko this week and the changes that we've made, everybody's virtually in place. Um, we've got uh, a new guy coming in, uh, Calvin Morris, to head up you know the performance science team. Um, we brought Emma Barton over from Australia. We've got Justin Grace in from New Zealand. Paul Manning goes back to lead the women. So there's a lot of changes, but we are we are virtually Rio ready. And uh, I said we would be by the first. And you know I've had long chats with Dave about this, and and he's always reiterated. You know by January you be need to be ready to push. And I think we're seeing change now. I think in performance, I think everyone's quite buoyant after you know Guadalajara and the way Canny's performed there and the team sprint performed team pursuit now turning it around Aussies are still winning obviously but we've turned that around so yeah it's all come together nicely um, Taking over from Dave Brailsford you mentioned about the talent pool there's been a, re- a succession of retirements of the real talismanic figures of British cycling without wanting to uh, make a glib um, comparison. Do you f- did you feel a bit like David Moyes taking over from Sir Alex Ferguson? <laughs> yeah, well, it's probably not on the same scale financially. I wish you I was on his salary, <laughs> and I'd like to think they're going to get rid of me. They'll pay me the same as they did Moyes. Um, yeah, it, it, it is. It's one of them things. You know, you've th- this has probably been the most successful sport in Britain. You know, when you look at it, so. It is up there with the best of the best, and you know, um, it's been a big ask for me. And as, as I said, you know, I've had so much support, and and you know, everybody around me's been. You know, we struggled early on. I think as a group, we struggled. But I think you know, leadership's something that you know, people just walk it. Dave just walked it. You know, when he walked in, you know, they knew the leader was here. So for me, being part of the furniture and as head coach to step up here probably people had a lot of reservations but I think now if you were to go out there and you were on the shop floor from R&D across to the coaching team and everybody else I think they'll they'll probably say the same thing now I'm actually I'm getting there and it has, it has been pressure but I've actually you know taken some good counselling um, on management and I think I've put the right people around me and if, if, if you're going to lead you need people around you you can trust and I think, you know, the team I've got here now, I, I can trust. And, and hence the fact that I've even stepped Ian Dyer up into that coach coordinator role, which is vir- virtually my old job. Uh, but by Ian's own admission, you know, he's, he's not an endurance coach. And that's why Heiko's come in to lead that side of the program. But uh, I've got a team around me I can trust. And I think, you know, it's imperative you, you have that. But I would like to take uh, a fee that Moyes took <laughs> when he left Man United if Ian Drake wants me to go. Shane, you mentioned the academy a few minutes ago. There was a sense that um, it was allowed to drift or it wasn't as successful as it had been under Rod Ellingworth, you know, when it produced Cav, when it produced um, Ben Swift, etc. Um, is that fair? And, and there's also been a lot of scrutiny on um, just the way Sky developed British riders and, and, you know, the young British riders and they've not had perhaps as much success as in that period when, when Rod was in charge of the academy. Yeah, I've read the criticisms, you know, aimed at the, at the academy and, and aimed at Sky, you know, via, via via Brian, let's be honest, you know, and what he said about, you know, obviously the Yates boys, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, let's just go back to what you talk about, Cav, Swifty, Stannard, Clancy, Thomas, Canner. You know, I can go on and on. It's not by chance these guys became great bike riders, Olympic champions not by chance you have that many names in that pool but you only have one Rod Ellingworth you know and Rod by his own admission wouldn't be the greatest coach in the world um, but he instilled discipline he he gave them lads I think you know a, a fatherly figure that they looked up to and they still do today and I think you know as as far as coaches go or you know you guys could coach 
these guys out here and get them, get them. Not, not sure about, not that, sure about that. But you are what you are as an individual and you'll get within a percent. That's how you find that one percent. And, you know, fortunately, Rod, Rod was able to find that, you know, and I, I get a bit narked really when I see the criticisms based at our academy now. And yeah, I wouldn't say we've drifted. I would just say that, you know, a change in personnel is always difficult because, you know, it's like trying to, if you, you talk about trying to find a man three, we're not trying to replace Sir Chris Hoy. We're trying to develop Callum Skinner or, or Kean Emity or Matt Crampton. We're not trying to replace. We can't replace Rod Ellingworth. We're, you know, we're trying to develop the next leader in that area, you know. So it, it's, it always, as I said, it narks me a little bit, the criticisms we get uh, and Sky get, yet, yet as all they've done is provide us, you know, fantastic back and you know a great service to, to the sport um, and they're continuing to do that and we we w will get talent coming through that academy system and as I said it just takes time you know you we, we, we had a really really good run under Rod and it's just finding you know that that little I don't know that little nugget that's going to be you know able to steer him in the right direction bring that discipline back to the to the squad um, we've seen it, you know, we had a, quite a bit of it, ill discipline earlier on, you know, last year in, in that system. And I think it's also understanding that these guys are virtually going into university. So they're going, they're living in the halls, it's all new to them, and you know what goes on at university. Um, but all of a sudden you see the guys like John Dibbon that settle down and realise they've made a mistake. And look at the performance of the guy. You know, you know, you take it, remove his Omnium last week because he was trying to do three team pursuits and do Omnium and everything else. You know, sixth in the world time trial, second in the next two major competitions, the Viviani, and John has really stepped up now. But it's just getting to understand and to, to the, the learning of what it's about as a kid. Whereas Rod was there 24-7, and we just don't have that at this moment in time. Can you become almost victims of your own success and that that academy it was such an established sort of conveyor belt of talent and success and mm -hmm. and younger kids coming through had, saw the success that Cavendish and the others had and the, and the pro contracts they were able to get and, and did a certain a certain sort of amount of complacency creep in that that for that from their point of view all they had to do was become a part of the academy in order to to really make it I think you've you've hit the nail on the head I think everyone that dones the jersey now thinks that they're going to be a success and you, it doesn't work like that. You have to work at it. And, you know, John is, is given proof of that right now. You know, uh, I think they think they've, they've made the squad, they've got the jersey, and it just happens. It doesn't just happen. You've, you know, winners make it happen, like Cav. Losers just let it happen. And that's where John was going, you know, when John Dibbon sat in this office right where you guys are sitting, you know, and... We had this heart to heart. I think you know he was in in danger of being one of those losers that just let it happen and wasted his talent. But there, there is talent there. Um, but like I said, you know, at this moment in time, we're pretty set for Rio, and um, most of that that young group will be looking at the bigger picture towards Tokyo now. One of the things Rod did was uh, put in place that Project Rainbow jersey, as he called it, yeah. that led really three, four years out from Copenhagen 2011. Um, it strikes me that the Yates twins are kind of, they could well be in five, six years' time, the kinds of riders that could win another world title for Great Britain. Is that something that's in your mind, putting together another pathway that could, could take them towards that? Yeah, I think, you know, we need to point out, you know, Rod's employed by British Cycling for that, and, you know, he's on Project Rio now. He's, he's virtually long-listed his team. Um, we sat here a couple of days ago and had a really good chat about it and how he's going to go about that because w we believe on that course, with the depth of that squad that we've got, if we if we get Rod to really energise that group and set that mission like he did with Cav, that we can we can come out of there with a medal and this is what it, this is what we're all about, you know, and you know I I would like to think that at some point that the Yates brothers will come home and they will ride for Sky. Because what a fantastic story, you know, the twins, they're, they're back, they're riding for Sky, could be, you know, they're, they're potential tour winners long term, we know that, you can see the talent that they've got. Um, but as I, as I said, you know, it's, it's something that we're working on now towards Rio with Rod, the plans are underway, 
Um, and he's all over it. He's, he's so passionate about it, just the same as he was when he wanted to win that Worlds in Denmark with Cav. So that's all in place and it's underway. So we're happy with that. Dave's totally supporting it. You know, uh, Rob Tansy at Sky, everybody's behind the whole project and Rod leading on it. So, we, we, you know, we wanted to keep Rod here and we're happy that he's staying. The Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Interviews and analysis. We've got the big talking points covered. So Shane talked there about being Rio ready by the start of January um, with about 18 months to go until the Olympic Games and I suppose the biggest question is whether Bradley Wiggins is going to return to the Team Pursuit squad in time for the Olympics. We heard Shane mention there that he's brought in Heiko Salzwedel, the German uh, coach who's been at British Cycling before. He's also coached uh, the Danes, he's coached the Australians and the Russians in the past. Um, He's come back to British Cycling and that perhaps... Um, frees up Shane's time a bit to work closely with Bradley Wiggins, not just on um, the road towards Paris Bay, um, but also getting him back into that Team Pursuit squad. So we asked him a bit about how he sees his relationship with Wiggins panning out over the next 18 months or so. It's a tough one, you know. So Brad's done it all, you know, and uh, we had a, a, a chat with Brad on the weekend. You know, Tim Carrison, who worked, we, we worked together for the tour in, in eleven and twelve, um, and he's got you know this this massive project going towards Roubaix. Um, he's he's going to focus himself on that and probably coming in touch the track a bit. He's coming in on Friday to meet Heiko, who's taken over that endurance program. Um, I think I think you know. Most people have to understand it's not a given that Brad will be in the team in Rio. You know, we've got some, some, some good boys in Team Pursuit. But, you know, when Brad gets a focus, it's, it's very hard to knock him off track. You know, it was a bit like him winning the Worlds this year. Once he decided he was, that was the jersey he wanted because it was the one that was missing, he, he, he can deliver. Um, I think, you know, we've just got to let him get the, the program out of the way, the classics out of the way. And then, you know, hopefully bring him back into the track. Um, he w- As he stated in the press last week, you know, he will be going for the hour in June, I think it is, thereabouts. Uh, venue, I suppose, still but still to be discussed. Um, and we spoke about this on the weekend. Um, but, yeah, he's coming back. And, you know, it's it, just Brad turning up pre the start of this program, you know, this World Cup program, gave the boys a massive boost. And I think we can see that already in performance, that they're all they've all stepped their game up. You know, Stephen Burke, um, Andy Tennant. You know the way Andy's. He, he, they've, they've all reacted really well to having Brad as part of this group. And um, if he if he doesn't bring the medal, he's brought a lot of strength to us already. But I'm quite sure, you know, Brad when he gets his mindset on something, he, he generally he delivers. So we're just looking forward to him coming back. To be honest with you. You mentioned when Brad's on something, he really is on it. And when he's when he's not on it, he's really not on it. Um, is is he a challenging person to work with? Why do why do you work so well together? I mean, I remember that Dauphiné um, in two thousand and eleven when nobody really believed he could be a Tour de France contender, and you were in his ear daily, just kind of reinforcing very simple messages. But you seem to have a real rapport with him. Why why is that? Um. Oh, I don't know. I think it goes back. It's it, it's historical, you know. The you know I raced with his dad and the whole thing and everything else. And when when we set out in this mission with m- myself and Tim and and him, I just think he believed in us as a team. Uh, we believed in him as an athlete. You know, the when you can go that fast in a straight line on a bike, you know, as Brad can, you know, you know you've got all the tools there to do the job. It's just that the way we had to do the job was totally different to what say Contrador would have done it or anybody like that you know and it was all, all always going to be about sustainable power from from the bottom of the mountain to the top it was not about you know having a load of tolerance stop start stop start it was brad working to his strengths and i think you know brad believed in us because you know we knew what we had to work with and uh, so you turned the mountain into time trials really ba- basically it was a time trial from the top to the bottom it was all always about sustainable power and hence the fact you'd see them attack him and he'd ride back up to him. So, you know, we just believed in him from day one. And I think my rapport with Brad is that, you know, I've always been honest with him, you know, and that's why I think we've got on so well. I've never never shied away from the truth, never would with him. And I always tell him as it is. And I think, you know, 
when the chips are down, he's he's quick to to, to acknowledge that he will get the truth from me, no matter what it is. He tried to. Uh, um, sorry, Shane. Last year, he seemed to just. Um, get his head kind of screwed back on at a certain point. He seemed to click back into that sort of super focus mode, um, you know, building towards California, etc. And what was, what do you think the, the kind of turning point or the, the um, eureka moment for him was? Was it just his pride was hurt? Was it he, he kind of, he was fed up of, of not being focused and he just, he felt the need to be focused again? Yeah, I, I think he got, you know, he gets to a point and I keep saying this, that, you know, people... People don't know Brad Wiggins, you know, you've got to live in the, the shoes of Brad Wiggins to understand what the pressure must have been of the first British Tour winner, you know, and what he had to live through over that 12 months and then, you know, trying to get his head back on. And the biggest problem with Brad was he never actually embraced the fact that he won the Tour. That's what I told him. And I kept saying, you know, Brad, you just got to get there and race and enjoy it because the people are here to cheer you on and see you for what you've achieved. But Brad's take on it was the, ex- the expectation of him to perform all the time, and I think that's what was killing him. But he had to embrace the fact that he won the tour. You know, you could never take that away from him. And I think he eventually started to get his head around it. And, uh, and you know, for me, it was always going to be tough for him, you know. Uh, and no matter how many times you tell someone, as an athlete, you still want to go out and perform, and the performances weren't coming. And, and then eventually, you know, just something clicked. He did. He got his head back on and, you know, we saw the way he was in the final at Roubaix. And that was a bit like, a, you know, a 20-year-old Wiggins riding Roubaix. He was like he was like a little kid. He was so excited. And to think that he could actually make the final, that's, that's what he was hoping, to be in the final. And he was there. And I think it, or previous to that, he had ridden Roubaix. I think it was about 25th, you know, quite a few minutes down and everything else. But that was a massive performance, massive boost to him, and I think you know that 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 set the tone that Brad Wiggins is back. In personally, in my eyes, he never left. The fact was, he just just didn't get his head around dealing with the success. And most of us in life, we all deal with failure. We do it here, week in and week out. We come back in, we train a bit harder, we get back in the gym, we go back to the drawing board and everything else because everyone can deal with failure. It's how we deal with success, which we all struggle with and we we've seen that in this program on a regular basis from like you know the Beijing cycle you know if you sit down with Sir Chris Hoy which you have done on on, on several occasions Rich you know trying to deal with 80 people out here to do a film shoot for you two Winnie Bay goes one full of books to be signed during the day and come in and do an advert you know you're going to capitulate at some point you know the demand on you is massive and you know Success is a tough one to deal with, and and that that's where a lot of people struggle. Well, no, more you, no, no. You, you mentioned Shane that that if if Brad makes the team for Rio, and I guess one of the, the the ways in which the team pursuit has changed in the last few years has been that it's got faster and faster, and it mm-hmm. and it favours faster and faster athletes. And I think w- Wiggins has always been a, a as you say, fast and straight line, but also a bit of a, a diesel. Slow twitch, yeah. Slow twitch. So is he, you know, physiologically, and at the age that he's at now, where he's presumably slowing down a little bit, um, you know, how would you rate his chances of making the Team Pursuit team real? Would you be able to put a percentage on it? No, I wouldn't put a percentage on it because, as I said, you know, Brad Brad could make me look stupid. Um, but, yeah, you know, you look at the data of, of Brad, uh, I think real time, his best times are 55. Uh, he's part of a world record winning team here. Um yeah, he's got a couple of 55s to his name and everyone look at the Beijing 53, which I didn't think we had a great Brad there. You know, he was ill going into that competition. The point of, of, of travel, he was just about not to get on the plane that day because he wasn't well. But he's got a 53 to his name there, but you've got to remember Thomas brought us down to 13 eights and we were catching the Danes in the last kilometre. Uh, Brad only contributed two and a half laps in that final. So, yeah, this is... A big challenge for Brad to think, you know, he's 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 got a 55 to his name. These boys have got 51s to their name. They're going to go quicker. Can he step up to the plate? You know, this is what I'm saying about Brad Wiggins. When he puts his mind on something, there's a challenge there. And invariably, he, he accepts it. And basically, he comes up with the goods. So I think that, you know, if you're looking to go 14s, say 14 flat or whatever... I've seen Brad here in training, you know, whip around here, you know, and he's knocking out seven ones 
and raising the pace. So I think, you know, from my point of view, he can do it. Uh, and he will be two years older. But he can only do it if he totally buys in because these guys are specialists. You know, the Berkies, the Clancy's, they're special they, and they're specialists at what they do. And I think we don't want to be falling into the trap of what the Australians done in Beijing when they, you know, they bring back the Browns and the McGees and the older guys that have been away from the track too long. The good thing about Brad is he's kept his hand in a little bit. And I think now, you know, once we get the spring out of the way and then he can just totally focus on the track, I'm, I'm, I'm sure he can, he can contribute and he can make the team. You mentioned Sky and British Cycling are still still part of the same family. I suppose in a lot of people's mind with Dave Brailsford moving on and, and de- dedicating himself full-time to the Sky role, there's a sort of, the perception is there's a sort of uncoupling there a little bit. Um, but, and you mentioned that you've still got a consultancy role with, with Team Sky. I mean, in your mind, is it this, the relationship the same as it has always been or, or is there a slight separation there? No, I think the relationship is probably stronger than it's ever been. Um, you know, Rob Tansy who's heading up, you know, the sky side of things down there with Dave, and that, you know, we've got to remember, you know, we've still got you, Ian Drake, and everybody on the board at Sky. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, you've only got to look at the Worlds. You know, Dave Brasford managed the GB team at the Worlds. You know, um, him and Rod basically run it for us. Yeah, I think the marriage is is great, and it, hopefully it'll continue in that vein. And and for people to say there's been a separation of GB and, and Sky, uh, you know, that, that's pretty ludicrous statement when you look at, you know, what everyone's wearing here today. And, you know, Sky are 100% behind us and, you know, we're 100% behind them. And, and as I say, you know, you walk 10 yards down there on your left is the, is the Sky offices. Um, Dave's in here regularly trying to get his office back, but uh, that's not going to happen. <laughs> this is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast with Richard Moore, Lionel Burney and Daniel Free. So we heard there Shane talking about the, the difficulty that Brad Wiggins had um, coping with success rather than failure. Shane suggesting that um, actually most people have mechanisms in place that allow them to, to deal with failure. I mean, I think that just underlines what a sort of deft um, sports psychologist Shane is and how that really has been one of his main roles in the British Cycling Academy. I always remember um, Mark Cavendish talking about the difference between Shane and um, Steve Peters, who was, of course, the, the um, psychiatrist at British Cycling, uh, who had helped um, numerous high-profile riders in the programme. Um, never really worked with Mark Cavendish, and, and Cav used to say that Shane was a far better psychologist, uh, certainly for, for his taste, because um, all... Cavendish needed was someone to basically inflate his ego or as he used to say blow sunshine at my backside and he said that Shane was the was the expert at that. I, I wouldn't say that you know Cav's time at Sky didn't work you know he still won races but he probably wasn't as prolific as he normally was probably the train wasn't the train that he, he wanted um, and you've got to remember we were pre- predominantly a GC team so you know Unfortunately, Cav probably didn't get the service that he needed, and I think he was quite vocal in that. But yeah, I wouldn't say, you know, Mark Cavendish has never been a failure. Um, we'd like to think that Cav would, you know, entertain looking at the Omnium for the games. Um, he's had some brief chats about it, and I know Rod's sitting down with him, and, um, and Heiko will be in touch with him. I think they have been in touch. You know, you got the greatest sprinter of all time, you know, and the Omnium fits for him now. You know, when you look at the way the points race at the end sets up, um, you know, and you've got Viviani out there dominating mainly in, in Omnium at the moment in time. Um, I just think it sit, sits there for the likes of Cav, Swifty. Um, you know, if they want to buy in, you know, I think, you know, they've got a, they've got a big chance in Rio. But at, at the end of the day, that's up to them. You know, these guys have got contracts and... They've got one of those contracts. Um, but that's not to say that we haven't got the talent within the building. You know, when you look at Clancy, um, we got and, and Dibbon now. So we've still got the talent here, but we, we would embrace the fact that Cab would even entertain putting his hat, he putting his hat in the ring, basically, for, for the Omnium. I mean, Shane, strikes me that, that you mentioned earlier you're, you're somebody who speaks your mind, you're, you're honest, and, and Mark Cavendish is also somebody who yeah. speaks his mind and is, is very honest and upfront. Um, how do you work with Cavendish? Is it quite, can it be quite a volatile relationship there? Or? 
Well, I've never really had a lot to do with Cav, to be honest with you. You know, I, when we go back to the early days, you know, I think I had a good relationship with Mark. I think, you know, he was hard work, um, but he had a good mentor in Rod. And, and you know, no, I, I, I love Cav. I think he's, he's a character and he's honest. And he tells you as it is. And, you know, someone said to me, half the problem, you know, you get yourself into trouble because you're too honest. And I think Cav has got himself into trouble because he's too honest. Because when he gets off the bike, he's had a bad day at the office, he's pissed off. He tells you guys to all go and eat humble pie, as it were. Um, <laughs> but that's Cav. And, you know, there's always something. When you look at the, you look at the Sir Chris's, you look at the, 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 the Brad's, you look at the Cav's, you look at the Pendletons, you look at the people that have come out of this building, the great ones, they all have something special, you know, there's something about them. And I wouldn't say it's always problems because we've had some great times with them, you know, but, you know, they're all difficult characters. So we heard Shane Sutton discussing Mark Cavendish's prospects of coming back into the British fold for the Rio Olympics, perhaps riding the Omnium and not the road race. Finally, we also asked Shane about some criticisms that have been levelled at him by Nicole Cook and Victoria Pendleton, particularly in their uh, quite recent autobiographies. Uh, Shane, as we said earlier, is is a very skilled psychologist and a good sort of people manager, very good hands-on coach, but not to everybody's taste. And they are perhaps two of the highest profile riders who have not always appreciated Shane's style or his methods. And as I said, they were very critical of him in their in their books. So we asked Shane um, if he would respond to the uh, criticisms made, and he began by talking about those made by Victoria Pendleton in her book. I want to get me two pennies worth in here. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, basically, I just you know to set the record straight. Let's let's start with the Pendleton situation. You know, Vicky was like a daughter. You know, pre Beijing, she'd split up with her, her boyfriend. She was in the process of moving into a new house. I'd be there at three o'clock in the morning, painting the walls to get that house ready for her to move in. I wouldn't do that for any other athlete. You know, but remember, Vicky was basically on her own in a male-dominated world at that particular point. She was our female sprinter. Um, you know, I'd go, I went around there in the afternoon, the plumbers had been in, the water was an inch deep all over the place. You know, I spent hours trying to get that place ready, got it ready for her and everything else. I was always there for Vicky. You know, I'd pick up the phone and check she was all right. I, I can remember holding her in the, in the track centre in Melbourne, bawling her eyes out, not wanting to do this anymore. At like at one o'clock in the morning, Dave waiting for us to come out. Um, and I said, you don't have to ride tomorrow, Vic. You know, this is sport, this isn't life or death. And you know, it's well documented that Vicky struggled with certain elements of her life. Um, but yeah, I was quite, I'm, I'm quite hurt by them remarks and, and, and everything else. But no, I've never read the book. Uh, I, I love Victor Bits, you know, she was a great kid. But as I always said in documentaries, you had two Vickies. So as far as I'm concerned, I only want to see the Vicky that I know. Um, what have she's, you spoken to her at all about it? Uh, we, we just chatted briefly at the Commonwealth Games, um, which was nice to see her. Um, but yeah, no, I don't. I don't really hold any grudges at all. I think you know we're paid to do a job, and sometimes you have to make shit decisions, and you've got to deal with them. And you know, I can deal with most decisions that I make. You know, I can hold my hand up and say, "Well, I made that decision for a reason," and and you know, because the decision will always be based on evidence, and that's what we do here. And I made certain decisions, and and at the end of the day. People aren't happy with them. Vicky Brighton have been happy with decisions that I made during her career. But ultimately, I'd, I'd, I'd put our women's record over the last 10 years up against any nation, and you'll see that we've probably been the most successful. Swiftly moving on, and just so Vic knows, I still love it a bit. She's still a great kid. Um, the Nicole Cook one probably cut me more than most. Um, I think I was challenged on radio during the Commonwealth Games on that one. But people don't understand what, you know, what level of abuse that Dave Brailsford endured during her career here, you know, uh, and myself. But Nicole would always come back to me. You know, I think going into Melbourne, I think it was eight weeks out or whatever, she said, I need your help. Going we're, to, we're talking about the Commonwealth Games. No, the World Championships. The in World, Melbourne. sorry, yeah. Uh, the World Championships in Melbourne. And, you know, I put everything into that 
you know, I wrote her a program, I put everything into it, said as long as you, you know, you comply with the training, you'll be fine, we'll get you around, you'll do a good job. She swung into that straight, I think they had, her and aunt had, what, 13 seconds? Swinging in around, around the right hander in Geelong, messing around, got greedy, got caught on the line, ran fourth. Nicole hadn't finished a bike race that year. I never ever heard from her again. So for people, for her to come out and start criticising me and all the rest of it, and to say I vetoed Delhi, I mean I had nothing to do with Wales in the Commonwealth Games in Delhi. I don't I don't know where this all come from, but I would like to go on record and say you know I do not know. Uh, well, I've learned a lot from the leadership of Dave during that period because of the abuse that he took at, at you know the hands of Nicole's father basically and it was probably one of them situations that you know Dave and I would drive to uh, we set up to Halfords you know under Julian Windercoacher we put everything into Nicole winning that gold medal we, we, we did everything we used to drive to the Novotel in Birmingham to have a meeting with Tony we created what you call Team Cook or, or, and, and Dave said right this is Team Cook we're going to be there we're going to be there 24-7 for her we're going to put everything behind this winning this gold medal because that's what we're about winning medals so you remove the personalities and you look at the medal and we, we'd, we'd be sitting there for 45 minutes to an hour waiting for Tony to turn up at Birmingham Airport you know at 7 o'clock in the evening you know we went beyond anything else we'd done in this program for Nicole Cook and, and I think you know Dave and I were, were both pretty shocked by the revelations in the book yet I've never read it it's only what people say to me and they all say that Shane yeah no I, I'm not a reader They're, I think the last thing I read was The Sun um, and I think I've only ever read one book in my life and that was The Rise and Fall of Peter Brock who was a, who was a car racing driver in uh, Australia um, and that, that was it uh, because in Australia everything was about the Hardy Ferrado 500 in them days you know the Bathurst and that was the only book I've ever read You've got, got, you've got to write your own book at some point, though, Shane. And yeah, and I'll tell you now, I will be writing a book. Um, but in that book, trust me, there's been a lot of happiness and a lot of bitterness through this program. But I won't be bitter because there's been there's been an amazing journey. And I, I, I'm, I'm as I said, I'm pretty shocked to see the likes of people that do write books that you know you see the bitterness in there, and and then you know. You hear the books like Sir Chris Hoy and that are written. That's what it's all about. You know, guys like that, you know, he's, he's a one-off. Um, they embraced the program. They took it for what it was. Um, and when I look at the likes of Nicole and Vicky, they're probably jealous of, 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 you know, the outcome of it all when you look at Sir Chris Hoy, where he is and where they are. But, I mean, there are always going to be people for whom the program doesn't work I guess and, and, and who wouldn't necessarily fit fit into it is that is that the nature of the beast in a sense that that not everybody can be happy yeah no I, I think going back to what Lionel said earlier you know made a, a real point point there was that this is elite sport and the coal face of it isn't nice it's a tough it's a tough place to be um and it doesn't doesn't suit everybody. That that's one hundred you one hundred percent there, Rich. Is because if you look at someone like Lizzie, the program doesn't doesn't suit Lizzie. Lizzie's a girl that wants to know the program's there for her, and she'll come in and she'll want her support. And you know, if something happens medically, we'll make sure that we're in there and we're getting the job done and everything else. So that affiliate role of the program with her works fantastic for her. But you know. She doesn't buy into the, you know, the program fully, and we don't expect her to. She just needs to know we're here for her because she's going to don the GB jersey. She's going to turn up in great shape, and and she's she's living proof of the program doesn't work for everybody, but the support from the program does. But her being actually full time part of this program doesn't. So in that sense, catering for talented individuals and building teams around them without them having to be kind of a focal point of a team at a time. Because one of the criticisms is that there isn't this, uh, wi the women's equivalent of Team Sky. Do you think that will ever happen? Um, I, I think the problem it goes back to success. I think when you look at our women, when you look at the Emma Pooleys and the Lizzies and you know the Nicoles and all these people, you know that we had we had a great opportunity to to creative team sky the problem is putting them personalities together was going to be very difficult 
and you know you talk to one person and they'd say one thing you talk to another and they'd say well I don't want to ride because she's there or I don't want to ride you know it was always going to be a difficult one for Dave and for Rob Tansy at Sky to get that over the line you know and there was a lot of work done by Trisha Thompson and everybody and you know even up to the start of this year you know we we had in-depth conversations on how we could create this women's team Sky but when you talk to Lucy oh well I've signed for skill uh, Lizzie, oh, well, I've signed from whoever, Bowman's or whoever, you know, and so on and so on. So, you know, I think it was always going to be difficult to get them all together. And, you know, it's a bit like when you when you started the creation of Team Sky, you had to start it a couple of years before you created it because of the contractual, you know, wranglings that were, were already gone on. How do you get people in? Well, look at the problems we had getting Brad out. So it was always going to be a difficult one, you know, unless you can actually say, yes, we're starting Team Sky women's team sky two years from today then you know, you've got a chance but if you come in a little bit late they're already contracted so it's very difficult you're listening to the telegraph cycling podcast tweet us at cycling underscore podcast so shane sutton there fairly outspoken fairly blunt as you expect with shane and his responses to the criticisms made by victoria pendleton and nicole cook um, some of his comments directed also at Nicole Cook's father, Tony, um, we should point out. He mentions Lizzie as well. There. He, means, he means, of course, Lizzie Armitstead. Um, of course, Victoria Pendleton and Nicole Cook have both had their say. I guess that's Shane's response, and he's entitled to it. We should point out as well that we have invited Nicole Cook to come on the podcast and do a, an extended interview, um, a little bit like the one we've just heard from, from Shane. She declined that um, opportunity at the moment, but said that she would certainly be keen to do so in the future. So that would be great to get her on. But Lionel, what were your thoughts on what Shane had to say there? Well, broadly, I mean, I think you get a picture of the man, um, that he's a man who really is a coach rather than a manager, and now he's having to step up into a management role. And he's, as he said right at the very start of the interview, he is he did find it hard at the beginning and is still finding it challenging. Um, but you can't help but sort of be energised by his enthusiasm and his kind of passion for bike racing. And, and I think, you know... What I was trying to hit on when I asked uh, the question about um, Victoria Pendleton and Nicole Cook, and it's not just about those two riders, uh, it's about anyone that perhaps hasn't got on with Shane that well over the years. It's that uh, it's quite a, it is a an abrasive environment, elite sport. When when there are medals on the line and the margins of victory come down to tenths of a second and tiny decisions that are made and, and just sort of instinctive things, I think one of the things that Sutton does very well is he um, he's a kind of a he puts into sort of layman's terms a lot of the technical stuff. So when anyone's getting blinded by either science or perhaps with Steve Peters um, quite clinical um, techniques Shane Sutton's always the person who will put it into English for you and I think that's why a lot of the athletes do if perhaps not 100% of the time like him they do respect him and they do listen to him yeah I mean I think he's got a a touch of the Brian Cloughs about him I always remember the story about Brian Clough um, the famous Nottingham Forest uh, Derby um, Leeds United for a very brief period football manager um, how he used to train his strikers just by standing on the penalty spot, feeding them balls and, and hitting them with a stick and saying, hit the target. And um, that is pretty much what Shane does on occasion, I think, um, in the in the track centre. But um, just on, on Cook and, and Pendleton, I mean, I th- with athletes, they're obviously not used to committing um, their thoughts and feelings to paper. And, and, and sometimes I think we assume that they, um, that what, ends up in their autobiographies and or articles that they write is you know what they profoundly believe in and it's a, a full representation of all of their thoughts about a single person um, whereas we know ourselves and it's a long process when you um, become a journalist or a writer and you have to learn how much things um, or how far and things you write can resonate and how they will actually look on paper and um, you know that's like I say that's a process that we all go through and sometimes we're surprised by what impact um, certain things that we write um, have and I think you know we always assume that um, you know they know exactly what they're doing when they're um, expressing feelings that might sound bitter or that they might be criticizing people who have been influential in their career Um, but I just don't think we should necessarily assume that you know 
they are they, they kind of are as ungrateful as they might have seemed in in their respective books it's also inevitable after a career in elite sport that you will have had fallings out and raised tempers and and and, and heated exchanges with people and the book is the opportunity for, to set the record straight from your point of view and um you know a, a wise athlete will perhaps um temper their thoughts words and perhaps not engage so much in that uh, score settling exercise and others others perhaps do so to a, a greater extent and and it perhaps has uh, the ripple effect that they hadn't anticipated um it is a, a you know a book is a sort of one way uh, conversation and you know a healthier thing would probably be to have Nicole Cook, Victoria Pendleton and Shane Sutton and Dave Brailsford sitting in a room discussing it. Maybe we'll try and do that. Maybe the podcast can facilitate that. Maybe. Yeah, I think Shane sort of hit the nail on the head when he said that sometimes you have to make shit decisions but he can deal with the decisions that he's made and that again is what um, being at the top of sport is about. You have to pick teams, you have to pick the best team to get the job done at any given time. Some people are not going to be in those teams and of course athletes go through periods of good form, bad form and their relationships with their coaches and management um, will you know they will go down as well as up that's that's just the nature of it and i think after, as daniel says completely afterwards when you have to then sort of sit down and reflect on you know a period of time um you, you're going to pick out the highest points and the lowest points and so and obviously people reading books will will kind of home in on um the the, the most eye-catching statements i guess mm. and although shane was blunt there i mean we all know that is his style and he actually i think he um he bit his tongue slightly there. I think he was more diplomatic than he would otherwise have been. Um, you know, I think this is, in Nicole Cook's case in particular, there are a lot of very, very specific grievances that he and Dave Brailsford have, certainly with Nicole Cook's father and the way he managed her career. Yeah, I don't think Shane would would shy away from saying any of the things he said to us to the people he's talking about I mean that's one of the things about him if you went to Shane and said oh did you say this about me he'd say yeah I did absolutely we should probably wrap it up there I think Daniel sorry you've got one more thing to add just one thing just to revisit what Shane said about um, Mark Cavendish and the Omnium um, I know that um, there are other people at British Cycling sort of trying to persuade Mark that um, he can do the Tour de France in 2016, whether it's all the Tour de France or just the first couple of weeks, and still be on good enough form, in good enough shape, um, with this kind of specific condition that he would need to then go. Presumably only about a fortnight after the end of the Tour or even a week after the end of the Tour and compete in the Omnium in Rio. It's going to be Beijing all over again, isn't it? Possibly. Your words, Lionel, not mine. <laughs> Possibly. Well, we hope you've enjoyed hearing from somebody who you might not be all that familiar with, but is somebody who is actually someone pretty important and has been over the last few years in in British and world cycling, Shane Sutton. Um, we will be back next week with a special dispatch from Lionel from the Ghent Six. You've got a very hard act to follow after uh, Daniel's Arctic report. It'll be a bit warmer in there, I'd imagine, but... Yeah. It will be warmer in the velodrome. Yeah, I'm not sure Ghent will be that warm. But no. Well, have a good one, Lionel, and thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. The Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Subscribe on iTunes, listen on Audioboo, visit us at thecyclingpodcast.com.